represents both constraints and opportunities. But the good thing with our country, we have good thing that strong uh, political will. So let us leverage on that because you have already uh, the good uh, political will. And as I was showing you the, the, the first slide, one of the key influences to primary healthcare financing is the political will. So we have the advantage. Let us tap on that advantage going forward. So why are we here today? This forum aims to discuss current challenges and opportunities to realize sustainable financing for primary health care in Tanzania. This event seeks to present the evidence on research around primary health care financing sustainability, increase uh, understanding of the challenges and opportunities of primary health care financing, identify actionable strategies and policies and recommendations that will feed into a primary health care financing sustainability roadmap. Then this will also help to foster a collaboration and knowledge sharing among stakeholders. Last but not least, there will be a strategic areas for our financing. So these are some of the, the reasons or the purpose of the today's uh, the, the meeting. But I thought perhaps I should also ask you and request you to go through uh, these two books, uh, which have been written by Tanzanian and also edited by Tanzanian, one on leadership and governance in primary health care. However much we need to have sustainable uh, primary health care financing, if there's no leadership and governance at the primary health care, we won't be able to arrive to that uh, dreamland. And the other thing is the issue to do with um, the primary health care in Tanzania, looking it at the using the system, health system lens, and understanding the history. One of the slides was able to tell us where we came from, where we are, and where we envisage to be. So these two books are highly recommended for the people to read, to understand on how best we can come up with a, a good uh, strategic um, uh, primary health care financing in the country. Asante Kwakuniskiriza. Okay, Asante Sana, Dr. Ntuli, and thank you for setting the ground for our conference in the next three days. So I'll welcome Dr. Bakari for the second presentation, which will be on uh, costing of the primary health care. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So, reflecting from what has been just said by the keynote speaker, that unless we have a sustainable financing, it will be difficult for us to achieve uh, the, the UHC, because we all know that PHC is, is also a vehicle for achieving the UHC. So we conducted a costing start in collaboration between PO Raj, Means of Health, and UNICEF to establish the financing gap that is comparing what we are spending now and what we should be spending uh, for us to achieve a quality service at PHC. So uh, it is well known now that unless you have a sustainable health financing mechanism for PHC, 
as I said, it will be difficult for us to achieve the universal health coverage. And therefore, we also need to address the equity issues in terms of service availability, as we are all aware that Uh, there's a problem with the technology, but I think I can go ahead. So we need to reorient our health systems towards PST, PST, I mean PHC, so, so that we can achieve the universal health coverage. It is therefore very important to prioritize financing, uh, sustainable financing at PHC for the communities to enjoy the health outcomes. So we conducted uh, a study uh, uh, aiming to establish the, the financial gap between the requirement vis-a-vis -vis the resources allocated as of now, as I said earlier. So we had three objectives. The first objective was to understand the cost of delivery of PSC by the government sources. We also um, estimated the total resources uh, needed to have quality services, that is the normative uh, costs. And lastly, we calculated the, the gap, resource gap between the actual expenditure and the normative uh, cost. So we had, you used the methodology um, uh, for both of the actual and normative cost, we used a secondary data review. We reviewed data for two financial years, uh, 2021 and 2022. As for uh, actual expenditure, we used uh, plan repo data to establish uh, uh, salaries cost. Also, uh, financial, facility financial accounting and reporting system FAS, we used it to uh, collect data on uh, uh, SKR providers uh, allowances, also um, uh, operational cost. Again, we also uh, used uh, MSD data to have information on medicines, supplies, and medical equipment. As for uh, normative costs, as I said, uh, we did a um, secondary data review for uh, the two financial years where you ha we had total salaries requirement based on the uh, staffing norms and taking into account that 15% uh, of this is always used for allowance. But also, we use a final quantification report to establish cost for commodities, but also a uh, past expenditure for operational uh, costs we use used for to establish the normative uh, cost. We, in our analysis, we focus on the following uh, areas. Uh, we used expenditure category, that is, level of, uh, I mean, that is a human resource, commodities, and operational costs. Also, a uh, level of care. As we all know, uh, PHC in, in the Tanzania, we have those three levels, that is dispensaries, health centers, and these hospitals. We also use the standard unit of output and the selected output and outcome indicators to do uh, uh, analysis. But also, we did, uh, using the, uh, the recent uh, uh, census report, we used uh, it to to calculate the per capita uh, terms. Now, what did we find? So, if you see this graph, you can see that there's a significant increase in terms of expenditure, actual expenditure. That in the financial year 2021-2022, we spent about 726 billion to finance primary health care services. The next year, we use over a thousand billion Tanzania shilling. So you see there's a significant increase of about 41%. But this, if uh, in further analysis, we realize that most of this uh, fund is used for uh, paying healthcare workers, that is salaries. So human resource for health takes a large share of this expenditure, but also uh, for the for the increase, this is also explained by the fact that we had, um, open, I mean, we had an upgrade of more than 300 health centers uh, built and constructed in that uh, financial year. 
The other analysis, as I said, we did um, per capita uh, analysis, and we compared the regions in terms of their capita, per capita expenditure. So the graph on your uh, left shows the um, per capita expenditure, and what is realized here is that you see that the, higher, the highest um, region is Njombe, but it is, low, it, is, it is below the standard, the WHO PHC uh, benchmark, which is around 57 uh, Tanzania shilling. So as a country, the average expenditure per capita in PHC is 17,000 Tanzania shilling, which is way below the, 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 the standard, the benchmark as uh, uh, provided by WHO. Again, there's also a disparity. If you see um, the Njombe and Simiu, you see the difference that per capita expenditure in PHC uh, for Simiu is uh, as low as you can see. But if you now uh, look at, the, the, at your right uh, graph, we have also GDP per capita. We compared this uh, and we realized that almost the same uh, regions with higher expenditure they have also higher uh, GDP per capita. Uh, we also did an equity analysis where we selected some few uh, health indicators. And from these two uh, uh, graphs, you see on your uh, left side is under five mortality, and the other on your, your right is the um, uh, ANC, Antenatal Care Visity 4. What we are seeing here, there is uh, a correlation between expenditure and health outcome, with a linear graph showing that it shows that the more you spend, the more you have a, a good health out outcome. But what you are also seeing here that there's evidence that there are some regions which had, which had an effective utilization of fund, because at the same level of expenditure, they have different health outcomes. So you have some regions with a higher with low maternal mortality rate at the same uh, uh, level of expenditure as those with the higher maternal mortality rate. This is also seen in the antenatal care visit that we have regions with um, the same amount of expenditure but different level of achievement in terms of health, uh, health, uh, uh, health, health indicators. So maybe this it can be explained because this we have just I mean, analyze data for government, maybe this could be explained that these regions are also receiving funds from other partners, but this at least is what we are seeing in terms of the government spending. So, as I said earlier, our last objective, the third objective was to establish the gap. So what we realize is that despite the increase in terms of financing in PHC, we are still seeing the gap of about 50% 50, 50 of expenditure in the government. And as I said again, we have most of this being directed to the human resource, and uh, most of the, the human resource, and few in infrastructure. This, uh, to some extent, uh, may also affect the quality of service. As we all know, that quality of service is all about health system. We have all the building blocks needs to be financed for us to achieve uh, the quality services. So what is uh, a problem now is that we are seeing that there's this 50% uh, 50, 50 uh, financing gap for these two financial years. We assume that, and you assume that there's also, this gap is being filled by the development partners. But as we all know, there has been uh, a decline in support from uh, development partners in recent years. So. This strengthens, I mean, it, it puts the PHC at, in danger for us to achieve what we intend to achieve in terms of achieving the uh, universal health coverage. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bakari. Financing PHC, if you don't know the gap and you don't know how you're using your resources that are there. So, this is a, a good foundation, again, to understand what are the gaps in PHC financing. So the next presentation will come from uh, Mr. Bintanga, and it will be about 
uh, domestic resource mobilization. You're welcome. Thank you very much, moderator, chairpersons, ladies and gentlemen. gentlemen. We all know that healthcare financing for many years has been a very big challenge for the sector. Therefore, it is for that reason that in our strategic plans for the sector and the Ministry of Health has been given that priorities in our plans. If you go to our national health policies, healthcare financing and resource mobilization is one of the topmost priorities. Apart from that, if you go to our health sector strategic plan, five, healthcare financing and resource mobilization has been highlighted there as one of our priority. More than that, in our ministry strategic plan, we have clearly identified in our objective E that we need to strengthen resources mobilizations so as to meet uh, our requirement to finance uh, the resources services uh, provision for the sector. So it is for that reason that we did a domestic revenue mobilization study. Minister of Health in collaboration with <coughs> UNICEF and the PURAG has conducted uh, the studies so as to find and maybe to come with the suggestions which areas of which you can use to mobilize the resources that to meet our needs. And uh, they find it, according to the surveys, it shows clearly that per capita total health expenditure in Tanzania is lower than other neighboring countries. If you see clearly, Kenya is ahead of us. The government resource allocation for health sectors is bigger compared to external financing, same to Zambia. Uh, government resource allocation is that big compared to, to ours, same to Rwanda, Mozambique, Malawi, and Uganda. Tanzania is just ahead of Burundi and the Democratic Republic of Congo. So, the government contributes to a relatively low share of total health expenditures, according to the stat. And despite the existing fiscal constraints, constraint, there is a need to identify the possible way to increase general, general government revenue and the allocation to the health sector. Ladies and gentlemen, So, according to the, the data we have, we have potential sources of revenues. According to Tanzania Revenue Authorities, we get a lot of revenues from telecommunication services, beer and cigarette, gaming, bottled waters, and the others, including potential sources of revenue, we also get enough of funds from items which affect directly the health of our people. So it is for that reason that we used the model to find a way of where we could get revenue to finance our health exercise tax uh, simulation model which was the model developed by researcher from the University of Cape Town, was used as a model of estimation potential so as to increase the taxation of alcohol and tobacco products and sugar-sweetened beverages. So based on this, we have assumed five different scenarios of which we customized them based on international best practices and feasibility analysis. Ladies and gentlemen, these are five scenarios. Scenario number one, if we maintain situation as it is, we maintain the status quo, 
there will be no change in government revenue. No change in year one up to year five. If we maintain, if we put 13% exercise tax rate adjustment, there will be the increase of 13% in the 2026 assumed year. If we maintain adjustment for affordability, there will be an increase of inflation per capita GDP growth rate for all assumed five years. Again, if we maintain 20% exercise tax rate adjustment for year 2026, there will be uh, an increase of 20% uh, in the year 2026. And the latter as assumption was <coughs> affordability adjustment plus 5%. If we maintain this, there will be an increase of inflation per plus per capita GDP growth rate and increase of 5% we have assumed in our scenario. And this will happen for all the five years. So what does uh, result tell us? The scenario analysis shows the scenario number three, the adjustment for affordabilities, and the scenario number five, affordability plus 5%, this uh, will result of more additional revenues across all product categories. As the graph shows, there is an increase uh, in, gra in scenario number three and scenario number five. And uh, uh, according to this, we will raise uh, the revenue from 1.4 trillion up to 2.2 trillion under scenario three and five respectively. And this could be raised in the next five years. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, does this analysis tell us something? Of course it tells. In 2022, if you see scenario number three and scenario number four and five bring us the revenue of 74 billions and 29 billions and 113 billion respectively. In scenario number three, if scenario number three will be implemented, there will be enough resources to cover half of the health center's cost for the health sectors. But the best scenario is scenario number five. If we implement this one, there will be enough resources to cover all of the health administration cost for the health sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> in conclusion, the current approach to revenue generation under scenario two, the three years exercise tax rate adjustment, that we do not suggest that scenario as it will result in insufficient revenue and escalating unhealthy product consumptions, the product I have identified earlier before. In contrast, annual increment adjustment under scenario five emerge as programmatic strategies, but we also suggest Police prioritization should be closely consider the political economy of the implementation. But also, the important thing is we need a stronger tax administration. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know that and agree that the government has put more effort in increasing government allocation to our budget from 1.2 trillion in 1919, in 2019, up to uh, above 2.2 trillion currently. That is not uh, something to ignore. That's, uh, the government has been doing good on this, but what we demand now is like the increase is not, is not uh, at required pace. That's why uh, we found these suggestions of which I present for you to see and discuss. Thank you very much, Mr. Mintanga. Now we know where the money for PHC is. So let's go and take it. So after those three presentations, now we're going to have uh, our panel discussion to reflect on uh, what has been presented here, but also other topics that will help to strengthen our PHC. So we are going to have a panel of, uh, currently I have five, 
So I will introduce one by one and then we're going to take the seats uh, near to Federica. So the first one is Dr. Wilson Charles Mahera. He's an accomplished civil servant and the leader. He's currently serving as the Deputy Permanent Secretary of Health at the Peoraj. He was formerly a senior lecturer in the Department of Education, Mathematics at the University of Dar es Salaam, but also District Council Executive Director in Arusha, and most recently, the Chairman of the National Election Commission. So Dr. Mayela, you're welcome. Our next panelist will be Dr. Grace Magembe. Dr. Grace is a public health specialist with over 20 years of experience in managing health systems at sub-national and national level, both preventive and curative and promotive. She currently serves as a Deputy Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of, of Health. So Dr. Grace, you are very welcome. Our third panelist will be Dr. Galbert Fejo, currently serves as the Health Systems Coordinator at the WHO Country Office in the United Republic of Tanzania. His major domains of expertise are management of primary health care services, quality improvement, health financing, result-based financing, leadership and program management, performance monitoring, but also knowledge management, advocacy, partnership building, and, and capacity building. So Dr. Fejo, we are happy to have you in this uh, panel. And then we have Dr. Paul Gwakum, is the Regional Advisor Health, UNICEF SRO. Previously, Dr. Gwakum was UNICEF Chief of Health and Nutrition for Zimbabwe and Zambia, Chief Child Survivor and Development for UNICEF, Madagascar, and worked for UNICEF in South Sudan, Angola, and Mozambique. Before joining UNICEF, Dr. Ngwakum worked for two years as a hospital doctor in his home country, Cameroon. So you're very welcome to this panel. And uh, lastly, but not least, we have Ellis Lang, works for USA Tanzania as a health system strengthening advisor, focusing on health financing. Ellis provides technical support to USAID, the government of Tanzania, and local organizations on health financing and sustainability practices. Ellis' specialization is in on health financing and policy, and has ex 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 uh, experience in supporting health financing reform, strategic planning, legal and policy analysis, costing and financial data analysis, impact modeling, advocacy, and related capacity development efforts. So, Dr. Ellis, you are also very welcome. Okay, so I thought I'll get the luxury to sit, but because of the technology, I'll have to stand up. So, we'll start with uh, Dr. Mahera. So, we have had uh, all this presentation with the keynote speaking from uh, Dr. Antuli in terms of uh, what PHC and where we are so far, but also the resource needs and uh, the way to raise uh, the resource for, for PHC. So, Dr. Mahera, based on your experience, what do you think are the ramification of uh, low budget allocation for the PHC? And would want to get your reflection in terms of your perception, whether you are seeing like there is a deliberate effort to allocate resources into the PHC in our currently health financing system in Tanzania. Can we have your quick reflection on this? So I'll ask you to stand here while we are waiting for the other microphones. Thanks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and all first presenters, as you have all, pre the, 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 the first presenters have presented 
the key message that I have got from them is that we need to invest more in the primary health care, especially funding. So now you ask what are the ramifications of low budget allocation for primary health delivery. It is obvious that low allocation to PHC may slow down the government's effort or capacity to achieve the national development objectives and sustainable development goals, in particular, sustainable development goals three. Because if we have low funding, then for sure it will affect the attainment of those objectives. So we encourage that more funding to be allocated to the primary health care. So specifically, low budget allocations for the procurement of essential medicine and supply as well as staff recruitment. The government has done significant effort to increase funding, especially in the PHC, where you find now that the availability of medicine is actually almost more than, on average, more than 90% in most of the health facilities. But still, we have increased the provision of various health, social welfare, and nutrition services, but then we have critical shortage of staff. So low funding means inadequate employment, but also inadequate purchase of maybe some equipment such as transport, ambulances, etc. So for sure, it can affect the quality of care and also relative deprioritization and preventive health services, which can lead to, the, which lead to an increased burden of preventive diseases and health care costs and they exacerbate health inequalities. Low funding can exacerbate health inequalities, disproportionality affecting marginalized populations such as women, children, and the elderly people living in the poverty area. So low funding also, while increasing allocation to the PHC, primary health care is essential to improve population well-being. It is critical it is also critical to identify opportunities to utilize existing resources more efficiently and effectively. So, yes, the government has got deliberate efforts. As we have heard from Untuli, the milestone since when we started the milestone of health provision in the country before independence, during independence up to now, so the uh, deliberate efforts, as you can see from various posters, the government is doing deliberate efforts to increase budget allocation. So there are deliberate policy efforts to prioritize the allocation to primary health care, as evidenced by the prominence given to the primary health care in various national strategic documents, where and the health sector reforms the country undertook. So you can see a large number of dispensaries, health centers, uh, 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 district or cancer hospitals have been constructed but also have been equipped and uh, there is uh, an, uh, deliberate efforts of recruiting health workers. Mm -hmm. So that nevertheless investment in the lower level health facilities should be furthered to bring health services even closer to the population. Because uh, you can see the theme of the, today that uh, universal health coverage as uh, a journey as a, a, a vehicle for the journey to achieve universal health coverage. So we need to do more of investing in the, investing in the lower levels. So we need to do more of funding, do more of construction of, for example, dispensaries, and that way then we become closer to the community. So primary health care prioritization efforts must continue as Tanzania embarks on the establishment of the universal health insurance scheme. The health services purchasing arrangement should be selected to incentivize primary and preventive care. Because out of the pocket, getting health services is very dangerous. I read somewhere from the internet that over one billion people worldwide are at risk of falling into poverty due to out-of-the-pocket health spending. So we need to emphasize that uh, health coverage, we need to emphasize that everyone is insured or can get insurance. Because they say the family can spend more than 10% of the or more of their household budgets. 
So, Mr. Moderator, that's what I can say, that uh, law funding has got uh, serious consequences in terms of provision of health services. So we need to invest more. And it is said that uh, the way to universal health coverage is to invest more in the primary health care. So in terms of funding, in terms of equipment, in terms of human recruitment, in terms of capacity building, and as you have heard also from Unturi, that also another channel is to invest in uh, community health workers. So the government clearly is doing a lot of efforts, especially the six-phase government has done a lot. And you can see it is evidenced that if we invest more, as uh, uh, Bakari has said, the, it is linear. The relationship is linear. The more budget you spend, the more positive health results that you get. So it is true that if you don't invest, as you have heard also from the presenter from the Minister of Health, then it will be difficult to attain the sustainable development goals. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mahera. So I'll quickly also jump to Dr. Grace. We have heard, yes, from Dr. Mahera, the government has done a lot in investing, but also we still need to invest more. And we understand Tanzania is a middle-income country, a low-middle-income country. We are living in independence. We have the core government, but also we have partners who are also supporting us. But we see the challenges in terms of the operation of the partners. So we would want to understand from the Minister of Health perspective, as the policy maker, the policy lead, what are the, uh, the kind of reforms that the Minister of Health is currently implementing or you're thinking to implement in order to align uh, the financing aspect between the vertical program but also the central government and whether there are efforts also for aligning the, the process of planning and budgeting and resource allocation. We would want to get a reflection from the Minister of Health. Um, thank you, our moderator and uh, my colleagues, uh, the panelists and all the speakers. Na wasalim kwenye na jamuri ya mungano wa Tanzania. Nitambue uwepo wa viongozi wetu mbalimbali mbali imeona wa dini, viongozi wetu wa kimila, karibu ni sana. Hiki kinachoendelea kimeka kita alam talam sana mtatusamea kidogo wakini badai tutaungana na njini. I hope mtatuia radhi kwa hilo. So, um, I think um, having vertical programs, it's not bad. Because looking at experience, why do we have vertical programs? Um, sometimes when, when you have a specific public health issue that you want to address, yeah, and when you want to reach your results, I mean, you are pressed, you want to have very quick results, it's okay to start with uh, vertical programs. But again, it's equally true that if you want to have sustainable results, yeah, you must strengthen the system. So I think the question here is, when do you really have uh, vertical programs? And when do you need to integrate these vertical programs in terms of to strengthen now the, um, the, the, the existing system? So I think that's where I'll, I'll focus my, 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 my talk. So as a government of Tanzania, and I think this is uh, all of us are aware, we've been implementing a, a comprehensive framework for integrating vertical programs within primary health interventions. And uh, through these uh, efforts, we've seen that a number of policies have been able to be aligned. You recall, actually, a few years back, we were really vertical. So like uh, programs like uh, HIV, uh, expanded program of immunization, tuberculosis, malaria, and other programs. They were very vertical in terms of uh, the infrastructure. You'll have specific clinics for CTC. They were very uh, vertical in terms of the human resource uh, management as well as training. People were employed in specific projects and programs. And there was no this um, communication between the government, uh, the rest of the services, and the vertical programs. But also we were able to see um, even the training curriculums. They were so um, 
uh, programs in such a way that they were addressing specific issues or specific disease intervention. But over time, we, are all, uh, we have all been able to witness a lot of uh, improvement that has been done in terms of human resource uh, management, but also training. Yeah. Now we have our staff within the rest of the services, I mean uh, the, 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 the general services, that are trained on various uh, specific disease interventions. But also the resource. We've seen over time how the resources that have been um, uh, that were initially allocated for vertical programs, how they've been able to be integrated in the horizontal services as well, and we've seen the spillover effect. All the massive infrastructure that we've done in this country, yeah, these were uh, integration between the vertical programs, but also the, uh, the, horizontal, the horizontal services. And I think one very important result that we've seen of recent is the institutionalization of the, integrated, of the community health workers program. Recently, our government, through the Minister of Health, was able to launch the integrated and coordinated community health workers program. Um, for, for many years, community health workers were trained for disease-specific interventions. So there are those who are trained on HIV, there are those who are trained on malaria, tuberculosis, and the rest. But now, as a government, after realizing that there's no disease-specific intervention that can stand on its own, we need a system to be strength. That's why we have come up with an integrated and coordinated community health workers program. So now we'll have a community health worker who is trained on various disease intervention or uh, on various program interventions. And we have uh, sat down together with our partners we've been able to identify the priority areas uh, like nutrition, you know, water and sanitation, you know, um, disease epidemics, but also we have uh, tuberculosis, malaria, and HIV because they are still diseases of public health importance, uh, non-communicable diseases. You will agree with me. Now we are faced with a double burden of, uh, like, People who have HIV positive, they are now faced with a double burden of diseases. They have HIV, but at the same time, they have non-communicable diseases. So all these are efforts that the government is taking to make sure that, uh, you know, we integrate properly between uh, the vertical programs, but also the, the uh, in terms of uh, integrating so that we can strengthen the health system. But uh, you'll agree with me, for those who are working in the clinics, we are now seeing our HIV patients coming up with... Um, uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases. Some of them have renal failure, but there are those who have got uh, nutritional specific disorders. So if you don't strengthen the system, what will happen to these people? Once they walk out of the HIV clinic, who will take care of their cardiac conditions? Who will take care of their renal conditions? Who will take care of their other uh, medical conditions? So this highlights the importance of integrating, but also utilizing the resources that are available in a manner that you know, will have a spillover effect. We, and I'm talking about efficiency. So the little resources that are there, how do we make proper use of them so that we see that spillover effect in other services that are equally important? A child who is HIV, HIV positive, they need to be immunized. Okay? They also need to be uh, given all the essential package of health services in their disease, uh, in their age specific. So, as a, again, as a Minister of Health, together with our colleagues in PRH, we are now coming up with an integrated model on mentorship and supportive supervision. So once we send a team to the field, when they are going for supervision, we no longer want to see people who go there and they go there with a narrow uh, mind that I'm coming here to supervise this specific disease intervention. So we are now coming up with a tool that will address health issues in a very comprehensive manner. You know, People can have different teams, but at least they, they should go there using the same resources to address all the important public health interventions within the community that they are, they are going to, to visit. In terms of data management, you are all here and you'll, you'll agree with me. We have so many systems, and we understand that for us to have uh, to design programs that are really responsive to the needs of the people, that are really responsive to the needs of the sector, of the health sector right now, we need data. So how do we get that data? If uh, this specific intervention, they have their data, another disease-specific intervention, they have their data, it becomes very difficult even to our, uh, to our healthcare providers. You find a person who is there, 
They have logbooks and registers for so many diseases. We are the ones who are talking about shortage of human resource. But how are we helping them, you know, in terms of aligning the various health management information systems? I learned about interoperability. It's a word that I never used to know in the past, but now at least I know about it. How can our different health management, man, management information systems speak to each other so that we reduce the burden, the paperwork, to this one uh, skilled health worker who is in the field overseeing almost everything in that particular facility. But they find themselves, you know, in the middle of so many data collection tools. So we have already DHIS2, we have Gotomis. So instead of establishing new and vertical data management information systems, can we strengthen the ones that we have? What is missing there? Can we fill the gap? So this is what the government is doing, and currently we are working on having a new EMR uh, system, and we believe that this is really going to address some of the challenges that we've been seeing uh, because of this uh, verticalize, verticalization that, uh, that we have. And this actually affects even our uh, national health management information system. If I'm in, I'm in facility X right now, and I, take, and I take an x-ray, and it happens that I've been referred to a higher facility. When I go there, do I need to take another x-ray in one day? How can you expose me to radiation two times in a day? So if we have a good EMR system, it will be very easy for my image, all my information, to be transferred to another facility so that when I go there, I don't have to repeat the same investigation again. Somebody will just go into the system, see what the previous facility did, and they can continue managing me. This applies not only in the clinical services, but also in the preventive services. We need to share information. Yeah? We need to look at a patient as, 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 as one being, but not you know, to verticalize you know, this one human being. This portion is HIV, this portion is malaria, this portion is, 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 is something else. So Talking a little bit about uh, harmonizing our planning and budgeting um, processes. It's true that uh, the aligning of uh, planning and budgeting processes it is very central to the successful implementation of integration, um, our integration agenda. You know, and it will also help us to efficiently utilize the resources that we have we have at hand. And as a government, we have developed uh, different frameworks that align the budgeting, uh, the budgeting and planning process. In the government, at least when it's uh, the budgeting and planning processes, it's all ministries. You may all, as you may all understand, health does not stand on, it, on its own. You know, health uh, is affected by so many other sectors. So as a government now, we are aligned. When it's the time for budgeting and, 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 and planning, it's like all ministries. So we share. At least we know which sector is putting which priority, which priority actually has also to be prioritized with another sector. So that's how we, we, we cross-share information amongst uh, ourselves. And uh, there are also ongoing efforts that inclu include a synchronization of uh, planning and budgeting cycles, but also uh, within the relevant uh, government uh, uh, agencies. But also now we've started with our stakeholders, various stakeholders, including our, our development partners. And uh, to ensure that priorities are identified, because this is very key. One of the reasons why we want to synchronize these processes, but also we are calling on you as our partners also to do the same, is that uh, before you start to plan, before you budget for anything, you must know your priorities. Resources are always scarce. Resources have never been, you know, enough. So the little that you have, if you want to plan, if you want to budget, you must make sure that the first thing you do, your prioritization. So if we harmonize our planning cycles, for sure, we'll have a very good forum, all of us, at the same time, to see what we put as a priority and what can wait. But again, this will give us an, an, an opportunity to strategically allocate resources. You know, problems are many, they are vast. But what do you start to address? Which intervention, if you start, probably it will have a spillover effect on other interventions. But the other thing is that uh, if, we, if we harmonize, 
if we synchronize our budgeting and planning processes, we are likely to address the most pressing healthcare needs that are, are really affecting our, our communities. So we've started, we have what we call the CCHP, the Comprehensive Council Health Plan, which is at the primary health care, okay? If you look at the CCHP, I'm telling you there's no intervention that is missing in that. And you wonder, why do we have all these various, you know, uh, planning cycles, you know? And now I'm talking to you, our partners and donors. We fully understand and we acknowledge your support. But really, if we will not align, we'll continue working in silos. And working in silos, it means even our, our allocation of resources, you know, will not be efficient. So yes, we might have all the money that we want in the world, but that will not give us the results that we want at the end. Because our resources will be so much scattered, they will not be directed to where the real problems are, to where really we'll get quick results or we'll have results that will really impact the entire, the entire sector. So to address this challenge, we understand that really as a government, uh, together with our partners, we need to have mechanisms, but also to enhance transparency and accountability. Sometimes we understand that you're also concerned with uh, accountability and transparency. But I think having synchronization in our budgeting and planning is one of the ways that will really enhance accountability and transparency. Because each one of us will be able to see what is there in the basket, what is a priority, where have we directed our resources, what are the results that each one of us is looking for toward, uh, is looking forward to, and really this will also give us, will take us to another step, that is uh, monitoring and evaluation, because uh, we know what we want, but sometimes we hardly reach there because we do not have mechanisms in place, you know, really to track the progress of what we had, we had a plan, we had planned to achieve, and this is because somewhere each one of us had their own direction. So we are working in different directions, but our aim is to reach at the same destination. So really, that's where the biggest problem is, and uh, we need to, we need to, 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 to harmonize there. So as now we are talking about um, UHI, yeah, universal health, um, we're talking about universal health coverage, universal health insurance. We cannot achieve all this if our planning and budgeting processes are not synchronized, if we don't know what we have at hand as resources and how efficiently should we spend it. My colleagues who were here to speak, they talked a lot about what really we are doing as a government, especially to make sure that every Mwananchi out there has accessibility, yeah? They've talked about how do we ensure equity, but for us to achieve all that accessibility, equity, affordability, synchronization of budgets and plans, but also harmonizing vertical programs with the rest of the health system. It means, you know, uh, making these tools speak, you know, using vertical programs to strengthen the health system. If we don't do all that, and then all this will, be, will remain as a dream that is very, very, very far-fetched. So, in conclusion, uh, what I would say is that um, Integration of vertical programs and alignment of budgeting, uh, budgeting processes, but also our planning processes is a very critical step in terms of optimizing primary healthcare services delivery in Tanzania and I believe uh, globally. And uh, we've seen preliminary outcomes, you know, that uh, with, 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 a, with, with a very few uh, interventions that we've tested, yeah? Because all that I've been saying, you know, we have not really uh, rolled out the entire country, but they've been, we, these are interventions that we've tried to test in various places. And of now, we've already started to see some very, very promising, uh, promising outcomes. So if we continue doing that, we are sure that uh, the resources that we have, they'll be utilized in a very uh, efficient manner and uh, we are sure that this will enhance uh, equity, but also we have uh, stronger health systems, and our services will be able to reach the very, very, very uh, last mile. Uh, we talk about all segments uh, in the population, because health is a public good, yeah? This is not uh, a financial good, it's a public good, whereby every individual in the facility, and especially with primary health care services, because these are essential services, every in individual in the community must have access 
to these services at an affordable uh, uh, at an affordable cost, but also they should get the services any time when they when they when they when they need them. So. I'm calling on our colleagues, uh, the development partners, but also uh, all other stakeholders who are here. Uh, I'm encouraging all of you to join the government, to support the government's efforts in order to foster integration by reducing fragmentation and other funding and making you know, these resources available to strengthen the health system for a more sustainable and resilient health system. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Grace, for that update in terms of the Minister of Health thinking. Both you and uh, Dr. Mahera were insisting on uh, focusing on results. And we are building the same house, PHC House. So the coordination between the government and partners is crucial, and thanks for, for those efforts. But we understand that uh, the experience from countries, to sustain the PHC, you really need to rely on the domestic financing. And as a low-income country, we still have a high dependency in terms of the partners. So we do want to hear, at least from the experience from other countries, on how we can transit from uh, this donor financing dependence to add more uh, domestic uh, resources in financing healthcare. And to reflect on this and to give like, the experience from other countries, I would welcome Dr. Ngwakum, at least to share the experience on how we can transit from the domestic to, to uh, from donor financing to domestic financing based on other countries' experience. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Good morning, everyone. You have to answer, good morning, everyone. Thank you. I think we've got so many presentations, and if we don't remain alert, we might lose focus. That's why I wanted to hear everyone at least responding back to me. Uh, on behalf of uh, UNICEF, uh, Eastern and Southern Africa, I just want to first of all uh, recognize and appreciate the government of Tanzania, all the partners and all the minds behind uh, the organization of this forum, and just to say you're one of many that are in the front line trying to improve healthcare financing and trying to implement universal health coverage uh, for the region. Uh, before I get to maybe answering the question that have been asked by the moderator, I just want to maybe re-emphasize some of the things that came out from the keynote address and for the other presenters. The first thing we have to remember as we go on with this conversation is Primary health care has to be sustainable. And for it to be sustainable, we need predictable funding. Another thing we have to come out of these conversations, having it in our minds, is what we call ODA, Official Development Assistance, which means foreign aid is not predictable and is not sustainable. And that's why in many countries in the region, uh, we are talking about domestic funding. I I'm just going to try to split the answer to the question from the panel into two parts. Uh, the first part will be talking about the what, and then we're going to deep dive into the how. Uh, with examples uh, from some countries in Eastern and Southern Africa. And I will avoid to kind of present something like comparing countries because that is not healthy. But I'm going to use experiences from different countries just to illustrate how they are moving forward uh, with these conversations. For the what, all countries in Eastern and Southern Africa they want to transit from donor funding to domestic funding. That they have it in mind. And they want to do this by ensuring that they sustain or they even increase the results that they are having 
from the programs funded by external funding. The second thing that they really want to do is to ensure that they have systems, systems that can help them deliver quality results. Because if you don't have systems, uh, you cannot deliver. So it's not just about increasing money. It's about making this money bring results uh, for their population. So that is what every country dreams about across the board in Eastern and Southern Africa and I guess beyond. How are they doing this? Two things. Number one, they want to increase fiscal space. They want to mobilize more money to be able to deliver health care. And number two, they want to ensure that the budgets and the expenditures are better managed. They want to make health care delivery cheaper. So, I will start with the first part and try to give some examples on how this has been taken forward across the region in terms of increasing fiscal space. The first thing is leadership. If you don't have leadership, you can forget about the rest. So most countries in the region have health as a political priority. They have adopted universal health coverage as one of the big priority agendas for their countries. And if I may cite the case of Kenya, where last year the president was in the front line launching universal health coverage. And in this launch, he personally commissioned over 100,000 community health volunteers or promoters, and they are going to be paid with government budget. If we do this, we are already on track, and I think we are doing the same. The second thing, you cannot pay for what you don't know how much this costs. You have to cost primary health care. And when you cost primary health care, you can then decide on what you have to fund and you can come out with laws and legislations on what you want to ensure that it is taken forward. You can be able to say, I have to ring fence certain resources that I'm going to use for implementation of certain key interventions for primary health care. And some countries, or many countries, have ring fence resources. For example, if you want to ensure that you procure your traditional vaccines, you cannot put it in an open basket. You have to ring fence this money. If you want to ensure that you contribute to the Gavi co-financing of vaccines, you have to ring fence this money. If you want to procure uh, drugs for your uh, uh, HIV patients, if you don't ring fence the money and the money can be used for anything, then you will not be able to have money when the time comes. And many countries are ring fencing money for primary health care and for specific thematic areas. The second thing, and I think uh, we talked at it in the other presentations, is mandatory insurance schemes. There are examples of countries where we've been able to have mandatory insurance schemes. I can give the example of Ethiopia, for example, where we have community-based health insurance, where per year you can have more than 11 million US dollars contributed by the communities to be able to take care of their health care. But of course, as I said, this can only be accepted when there are strong systems. If the health facilities don't have supplies, if the community contribute their money, they come, there are no supplies, they won't be able to contribute again. So you have to have a system that functions. And because of this community-based health insurance, the communities are averted from catastrophic out-of-pocket expenditures. But there are other ways of creating fiscal space by earmark taxes. And I think Dr. Ntuli gave examples of proposed earmark taxes for Tanzania as well. 
if I give the example of Zimbabwe, where they have the whole, what they call the health levy. Health levy is 5% of every phone call is taken, is reinforced. It is used to be able to procure medication and some supplies for hospitals. We also have what we call the eighth levy. It's about 3% of salaries of all civil servants that is reinforced and it's given to the National AIDS Council and it is used for interventions for HIV. I can go on and on and on, but these are local initiatives, context specific that can be used to be able to create fiscal space and have more money to be able to ensure that healthcare is financed. But of course, the most important portion of financing primary health care is government budget. We all know about the Abuja initiative or the Abuja declaration. Many countries don't walk the talk. And I think we have to continue advocating for countries to put the 15% of national budgets that they advocated for and ensure we have proper allocative efficiencies. And this is something all the countries are doing in the region. It goes up to nine, it comes back to seven, some go up to 12, but we have to continue pushing for this. And the 5% GDP, um, uh, GDP which the SADC countries ask for is something we have to continue advocating for also to be able to ensure we have enough fiscal space. But as I said, it's not just about more money. It's about using the money efficiently. It's about making healthcare delivery cheaper. It's about ensuring that we invest in the things that are going to bring better dividends. If you prevent, for example, someone from getting HIV, you are saving money that is going to be used for buying antiretrovirals for a lifetime, and this can be used to be invested in doing other things. If you vaccinate a child and you don't have a backlog of children that can give you a measles outbreak, you are saving money. So I think these are some of the things that, in as much as we are creating fiscal space, we have to ensure that we invest in what is going to give more dividends. The second part I talked about, once the money is there, there has to be mechanisms of ensuring better budget and expenditure management. And there are examples which can pick even from Tanzania here about implementation of intergovernmental transfer for health. And the fact that money is sent to the health facility where we are having the implementation, I think uh, this is something that has to continue, but it has to be even more flexible whereby we don't ensure that money is sent for activities. The level of implementation should be able to manage this money for results and deliver the outputs and the outcomes. Because when money is sent for activities, we get the money back at the end. Money was not utilized because that activity was not implemented. But we don't get the results for the population that we are kind of uh, expecting. The second way which countries are using to be able to improve management is by mainstreaming resource-based financing, providing resources that are going to be able to deliver certain results and monitoring the results to be able to send more money. The last thing I just wanted to share is innovations, and I think I did hear the other presenters talked about innovations, digitalization that is going to help us to be more efficient. I can give you an example where you can have money to pay community health workers, but since they live in far away areas, and this is small money, if they have to come to the district headquarters to collect the money, it's almost like not paying them. There are countries that have been able to do bulk payment using mobile platforms where they send the money through the telephone of these village health workers because we have 
mobile money transfer. So these are some of the innovations that we can think of to be able to improve the management of the money that we have. So in a nutshell, I just want to say improving domestic funding for primary health care is a choice of leadership. Governments, with our assistance, have to make the right choice by ensuring that allocation of the few resources that we have is geared towards what is going to give us more dividends. Another observation from the different countries is that most of the time, health ministries speak among themselves. And I guess before we end this forum, we'll be able to hear from the Minister of Finance on how they perceive or what they think they are going to be able to do to ensure that it's not only the Minister of Health, but it's the whole of government, whole of society, talking about efficient and effective implementation of primary health care. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ngwakum, for that reflection. So we have a vast experience from other countries where we can uh, learn in terms of transiting from uh, donor dependence to more domestic resource generation. And the important message that's coming out is the political will. If there is a political will, everything can be done. And lastly, Dr. Ngwakum, you introduced the aspect of uh, making a better use of the resources to improve PHC in terms of uh, efficiency. Wanasema uwezu kaomba ela tu kama ela ulizonazo hautumi vizuri. Mwachokuwa na jaribu kukiongea Dr. Ngwakum. Tutumie, tufanya matumizi vizuri kwa kile kidogo tulichonacho tupate uduma bora za afya. So I would welcome uh, Dr. Fejo on this discussion on efficiency to reflect on how we can really improve cross-programmatic efficiency, to make a better use of what we have, but also to do a better coordination between the different programs. If you can reflect on that, Dr. Fejo, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. How to make a better use of resources I will start where uh, uh, my senior brother ended by saying that uh, uh, if when you look at other countries, they, in, in the last three years, Kenya, Ghana, South Africa, and even out of Africa, Bhutan, Lao, conducted these cross-efficiency studies. And when you look at the, cross, the result of the cross-efficiency studies, you will realize that the conclusions are almost the same in developing country, even out of Africa. Fragmentation, uh, uh, non-alignment at the implementation level, non-alignment of supply chain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I, I even realized that out of Africa, some of the country have even doing poorer than uh, than us, because uh, in some of the country they were pointing out the fact that even the planning is, uh, is not clear, not only fragmented as Dr. Grace was mentioning, but not even clear. And when you look at all these countries, you look at the, the, the recommendations later, you always have the same recommendations once again. I, we, we end up wondering, all these which list how do we effectively implement what we are what, what we are recommending? And I, I would just say that the, it, it is the, 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 this is the time for us to think about the how when we are putting the recommendations, including for a conference like this one. Most of the time, at the end of the conference, we will have what to do, but we will not explain the how to do. And again, when you look at the, these studies that are conducted at national level, and I always say that, uh, Frederica, I'm a district officer <laughs> working in WHO, you, I always ask myself, if I was a district health officer, how would I achieve this? And I hardly have an answer to that. 
I, I hardly ha have an answer because sometimes the recommendations are very generic, and most of the time, the studies do not really go deep down into what is happening in individual health facilities. Then my, my, my takeaway will be that for the next month, let us go deeply in the health facilities and see exactly, yes, at national level, these are the inefficiencies. But at health facility level, what, do they, what are the income that they are effectively having in terms of uh, uh, out of pocket, what are they in, how are they paying all the volunteers? We know that 30 percent of the volunteers in this country are paid uh, 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 I mean the, uh, the, the proportion of health workers in primary health care services that are not employed by the government, the volunteers are almost 30 percent. How are they really managing to pay? Because sometimes at national and international level, we are reflecting why people at the lower level already have the solution, and they are implementing the solution. And that's why usually you will look at the studies with all the challenges, and you will see that, oh, in Tanzania, the maternal mortality was, I mean, reduced by more than 100% in the last uh, uh, 10 years. In Tanzania, the child mortality was divided by two. And you wonder if we are not missing something by not speaking enough with people at the local level. And concretely, to answer your question, Mr. Moderator, it is starting with the planning, as Dr. Grace was saying. Sometimes not just doing the top-down planning that we are doing, sitting here in Dodoma having the health sector strategic plan, but really informing the health, strategy, the health sector strategic plan by district coverage extension plan. Yes, we have this council plan that are very good, but the problem, one of the problems I, I see in the council plan is that it, it is only for a short period. It, you, it doesn't show how in five years or in ten years the district will extend the primary health care services. That is something that I think we need to address. Because by addressing that, and by taking from the district level the need in human resource, in community health workers, the need in, 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 in equipment, in, in infrastructure, etc., it may help us at national level in integrating our program. As you know, and at national level, we have several initiatives Acceleration plan for human resource, acceleration plan for quality improvement, uh, community health workers. And when you look at all the budgets, you ask yourself, how will the government put all this money? You know, they are competitive. Uh, uh, I mean, other sectors also need the funds of the government. The government is paying for the police, and all of us, we want the security. They are paying for the education, and all of us, we want to send our kids to... to to the school. So, so the first point is really taking into account the multi-year planning from the district level to the national level when we, are, when we are developing the health sector strategic plan. That is one. The second element, I think, as we are preparing for the national health insurance, is giving a little bit more autonomy to the health facilities. And I, uh, auto they already have some autonomy, uh, some level of autonomy. But I think going to the health insurance, they will be more a business. I know that public health do not like this world, but the health facilities will be more a business because they will have the income from the health insurance. They will spend to produce the health for the population. This income will certainly increase and how will we organize it how will we make sure that we are not paying for inefficiencies how will we uh, make sure that we are not paying twice for the same thing because the government will be paying the staff will be paying for the medicine will be paying for the equipment and subsidizing the poorer in the uh, uh, in, in, for the health insurance at the same time subsidizing the public servant for the health insurance at the same time how do we make sure that we, the government will not be paying twice 
That is a very good question. In terms of equity, how will we make sure that we maintain the, the benefits of, uh, of, the, uh, of uh, the exemption policies? And the exemption policies in this, in, in this country, I think, have really contributed to the reduction of maternal mortality that we are appraising. How will we make sure these people, when we are implementing the Universal Health Insurance Bill, some of the, some of the beneficiary of the exemptions are not losing those benefits along the way? These are very good questions to be answered. And this is a good forum to start with when we are answering the, uh, uh, the, 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 these questions. L l lastly, I, 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 I will say we need also to take advantage of, and I think other speakers have already put it even better than I, I, I wanted to do, we need to take advantage of the technology. And the, the basically, starting by basic things like digitalizing health information system. These studies you, at national level sometimes do not answer some of the few questions. I, I, when I was working in a health center, I end up realizing that, but we were saying we don't have, I mean, we don't have the money to purchase the computer. But if you take the number of registers that a district hospital is purchasing every year, you realize that we can digitalize the whole system with that amount of money. And I visited a few health centers and dispensary every year in Tanzania, and I realized that sometimes we use the register, we, take, we put everything in the register, then we copy in the computer later. And moreover, there is one computer for the health insurance, another computer for, for, for the HIV, and we are giving even more work to the health workers why we could reduce the workload with the, uh, with the digitalization and, and improve the integration Dr. Grace was talking about. Because if we really work on coding correctly the, 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 the health interventions, by digitalizing the, 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 the patient file, it, it, we, we can improve the referral system by introducing the triage in the software that are used in our health facilities. Avoid some of the patients going directly to Muhimbili Hospital. You, you have an abscess, you go directly to Muhimbili because you are benefiting from the exemptions. It's important to work on those very key inefficiencies that are very simple to address at, uh, at premier healthcare level. And sometimes we are missing the, 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 the part. I, I don't know if I've answered your, your question, moderator, but really, I, I, I think that it's really uh, uh, important for us to deep down our reflection to the grassroots level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fejo. So the important message that is coming out is for every planning and budgeting, we have to involve the community. Tunafoka kwenye almashauri, tunanda mipango na bajeti, mpango wa andali uko kukaa kwenye almashauri tu, ni muhimu kwenda kule kwenye ngazi ya kijiji, mtaa kwa shirikisha wananchi kuweza kuanda. Lakini pia, mungila cross programmatic efficiency. Kuna donors, kuna implementing partners, tunavu anda mipango ni lazima tuyandai kwa pamoja. Na yoti natakewa kuwa shirikishi. Tuwanze kwenye kijiji ambapo kundo kuna maitaji ili tuweze kuwa na vipaumbele ambapo vina, vina reflect yale maitaji ya wananchi. We need to prioritize based on uh, community needs. So in the same discussion, I would want to invite um, Ellis at least to reflect also a little bit because we have been talking about cross-programmatic -prog efficiency, how we can better align partners, donors, and the government. But you really can't do that at one time. There is a time to transition and manage the transition better. So I would want to welcome Ellis to reflect and give us some experience in terms of how we can 
better manage this transition from dependence on donor financing toward uh, domestic fin financing? How can we manage that in the short, the long term? You're welcome, Alice. Good morning. So when we're talking about transition or transition more towards domestic funding, we're really talking about sustainability. But that word is thrown around a lot, so what does sustainability really mean? There are many different definitions, but when you look across US, UN agencies, the US government, and other definitions, you get one common thread, resilience the capacity to meet the present needs and durability and adaptability to respond to the future needs and accommodate shocks and changing circumstances. So building sustainability requires thinking about efficient, effective, integrated, high quality service delivery, governance and leadership, financing, laws, regulations, policies, and the enabling environment, human resources, health information systems and data use, and supply and logistics. And to further ensure those successes, as my colleagues have said, we need political will. We need accountability and transparency, and we also need public and private partnership, coordination and collaboration, really fostering market-driven solutions and a total market approach. Sustainability and transition away from development partner funding takes time and agreed upon plan. But we're not starting from zero, never have been. Government contributions make up a significant proportion of the contributions to the health sector, including infrastructure, human resources, ICT, governance, etc. However, we all know that there's still a high dependence on development partners especially in health programs that have been historically verticalized, partially due to development partner policies, such as HIV, TB, malaria, even family planning, such in supervision, service delivery, data, monitoring and valuation, and commodities. So we need more, and we need more efficient investment from the government to really ensure this sustainability long term. But we also need to leverage and enable the domestic private sector and have intentional engagement and partnership. So what do we do? How do we do this? We, as health sector actors, start from where we are and build on the existing systems, structures, and capacities. We start by identifying mutual priority challenges to address together, devising solutions that address the root causes of those challenges, not just the service level challenges. So we often, we tend to put a Band-Aid on a solution in an attempt to respond quickly to an evolving situation. But that's not ever going to end the particular problem or solve it. We really need to go to the root cause, because otherwise it will keep coming back. So we can't just focus on treatment. We also have to work on prevention. We can't just offer everything for free. We have to think about market-driven solutions as well. So in addition, we have to use our data. We have to use data to identify where we can push and pull and target resources, really to ensure equity and ensure that the most vulnerable populations have access to quality health care. Second, we have to identify those transformations and adaptations that are needed for long-term success. So the programs as they are now cannot continue. They are not sustainable. So what adaptations and transformations do we need to think about within our own programming, within development partner programming, to ensure a sustainable integrated response? And third, we need to invest in further developing underlying systems and policies that govern the health sector. So this can be public financial management, health information systems, supply chain, and more. Then, once we've decided on those, we divide and conquer. Each institution 
should focus on what is at the core of their mission and within their core capacities. Every single institution and player has a role to play. Let's let everybody play it based on their strengths. This includes the private sector, commercial companies, for-profit companies, not-for-profit, faith-based, community-led organizations. Everyone should be engaged in all conversations. And, and government and development partners also need to support these local entities as well. This can be through social contracting, as we've seen, or outsourcing, as we've seen in Zanzibar, or through development partner support and capacity development to local institutions. And lastly, we need to co-monitor results and communicate clearly, effectively, and often. We have to do this together. The government is our steward, should continue to be. The government should prioritize the health sector and really demand coordination and collaboration amongst all development partners, as well as integrate the private sector. Over time, if we do this, slowly the domestic market and the government will take on more and more and more of the health sector financing. So if we work towards a common goal, intentionally strategize, communicate openly. There's no limit to what we can accomplish together. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Alice. So on top of uh, making a better use of money, I think the important point that has come here is the role of private sector. To primary health care at Ongele Serikali too, kuna, kuna sector binafs pia, ina mchango mkubwa sana katika utuwaji wa uduma hizi za afya ya msingi. Kwa private sector ni ya muhimu sana. Lakini pia muhimu wa kutumia takwimu kwenye kufanya maamuzi ya kuwa locate resources. So, we have had these uh, five panelists reflecting on these different parts. And a lot has come out in terms of how we can uh, get more money to the primary facilities, but also the plans to improve coordination between partners and, and the government. But the bottom line is uh, how to get more resources to do all these things. And for this, we have the Minister of Finance as the key stakeholders. It's the key stakeholder because this is where all the decisions about fund allocation is taking place. So maamuzi ya fedha kiasi gani ziende kwenye kijiji, ziende kwenye kata, kwenye mtaa pamoja na kwamba tumekaa huku chini tumejadiliana Wizara ya Fedha anakuja sasa kwenye kufanya maamuzi ya kugawanisha fedha. So we are likely to be joined by a, a panelist from the Minister of Finance, Mr. Mololo. He is an assistant director for budget but is also responsible to oversee the budget and planning at the regions. So this is the right person to have when we are talking about PLC. So Mr. Mololo, I decided to keep you the last so that you can reflect on all these uh, proposals that have come here. And we would want to hear your reflection. We started our sessions today with a presentation on costing, but also proposals for domestic uh, resource mobilization. And one of the proposals that is coming is to have a mechanism to earmark the resources for PHC from the sources, from different sources, especially on looking at the excess taxes. So we'd want to hear your reflection on what is the possibility of uh, raising and earmarking domestic revenue from taxation system to finance the PHC. But you also would want to hear your reflection on how the Ministry of uh, Finance is preparing to manage this transition from uh, donor dependence toward more domestic uh, reliance to financing the primary health care. What is the uh, policy uh, preparations that are happening at the Minister of Finance? You're welcome, Mr. Malone. Thank you. Uh, as, 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 as the the members who have get out from here, he said two, two, 
two main issues which I will be discussing, which I will discuss here. It is a feasibility of resources to allocate to many sectors. Uh, actually, we are doing so. We are trying our level best as the Minister of Finance to collect resources from different parts, from different resources. Uh, but as you know, uh, our country, when you compare to most near, nearby countries, we are collecting low compared to GDP. Our tax is very low as compared to Kenya, to other, 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 other neighbors countries. But we try our, our level best and we try to allocate it to, 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 to health sectors. As you know, the government has done many things to healthy sectors. They have constructed infra, infra, infrastructures uh, and they are, they, are, they are trying itself to facilitate those, those infrastructures which has been con constructed. But as I said, we have a law, a law, a law, a law, a law, a law tax based as, to, as compared to GDP when you compare to our neighbors. Why? Because our sectors is mainly comprises with the informal, informal sector. Not catch them and correct the resources. But the government is now trying itself to, 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 to reform those informal sectors. Uh, they are trying, they, it, it's, the government is trying to its, it, to its best level to inform, but it is not easy. We have to work together with many sectors so that those sectors we can, uh, we, can, we, we, we can put them to the area where they can do business and the government can correct it. As you see now, we are, we are, we are building Machinga's infrastructure. We are building many in, in, in many in, in many in many districts. We build Machinga's Machinga's infrastructure so that to accommodate them there, and their business should be informed, reformed there, and we can correct it, uh, as much as possible the the tax. But we are not only doing that; we are also reforming the working environment so that to attract many many investors. That is where the government can correct and get enough money to allocate to health sectors. Also, we are reforming the, the administration tax, tax so that they can work well, they can get enough money to allocate to health sector. Reforming those administration is going together with reforming the systems, digitalization of correcting those tax, 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 tax revenue. Uh, the second thing is how now the government is uh, preparing when they, to pre preparing what the, the, our development partners supporting us, how we are preparing to have those resources. Because now, the, recognizing that the tax basis is low, our development partners is supporting us. We need really them, we, need, we really need them to continue to support us. But now, now, now how are we, now, now how the government is planning to, to, to the transition process? The government, recognizing that development partners are assisting us, we are engaging them with, the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with different sectors. That is where we are getting their resources, what they can assist us. But we are getting many problems that not all development partners are channeling their revenue to the government systems. Some they are correct, some they are channeling their resources directly to the, to the project they are assisting. So the government is now becoming difficult to recognize those resources which are going directly to the project. So I'm here to call the, the development partners to channel their resources to the government systems so that we can, we can recognize all their supporters so that we can know now what really amount is needed to support our health sectors. When we, when we got all the resources from the development partners, now we can have a real figure. 
that this is the figure now our development partner is supporting us. Now, how we can prepare as ourselves when we, when we are reforming our, our tax, when we, are reform, when we are reforming our environment working, and so we can now get the real figure so that we can go very well in the transition periods. So I'm here to call upon the development partners. Please work with the government system and assist us where there is a weakness. We can strengthen them so that our resources can be very clear and they can be manageable well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Malolo. So there's a call at least to align our development partners' resource allocation. So what the message that is coming out, the Minister of uh, Finance wants to know how much resources is in there so that they can also make decisions in terms of allocating more. So after this discussion, I would now want to open up. We have like 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes for questions, reflection on what we heard from the, the panel, but also from the initial presentations. So we'll have the microphone moving around so you can raise your hand and then the microphone will uh, reach you. But also if you want to do a little bit of exercise, we have this microphone as well. You can work and, and also use this. Can I see the hands? Anybody with a question, a comment or a reflection? Now, karibisha kwa maswali, yote mwenye maswali kwenye discussion yetu tuloifanya leo kwenye maeneo ya upatikanaji wa fedha zaidi kwa ajili ya kufinance primary health care lakini pia namna bora ya kutumia fedha kidogo tulizonazo ili tuweze kuboresha afya hasa kwenye ngazi ya jamii karibuni You want to use that one? Okay, it's coming. Okay, now Salim Kwajina Jamulia Mungano at Tanzania. Okay, my name is Dr. Lilian Mbuni. I'm working with Temeke Municipal Council. Naomba ni toe komintiang umoja kwa moja. Niricho nina miaka minne kamana nusu nafanya kazu with the primary health care facilities both Alban and rural areas. Nilicho jifunza ni kwamba uku levels za chini our implementers wakipewa maelekezo vizuri na wakaelekezwa na wakajengewa uwezo wanafanya kazi vizuri sana. Kwa hiyo nizidi kushauri serikali na implementing partners na wadau wengine kuwekeza nguvu huko chini kwa sababu wanavyopata maelekezo vizuri wana implement na Tunapata matokeo chanya. Asante. Okay, asante sana. Uzuri tunao watunga sera na watekeleza jisera. Ujumba ni kwamba ili tuweze kuboresha utuwaji wa afya kule kurengazi ya chini ni muhimu kutuwa maelekezo sahihi. Asante. Karibu. Asante. Habari za subwe. I mean, my name is Joseph Komuhangiro. I'm the country director for Pathfinder in Tanzania. Uh, let me join my other colleagues to thank everyone who has made the presentation today. I think the analytics were great and uh, very informative. I would like to direct my question maybe to, um, to the deputy um, permanent secretary for PRAG. And uh, I would also request Dr. Ntuli if you would make a comment in response to my question. So this is my, my, my feeling. Uh, having listened to all the presentations and the analysis, I'm feeling like there is a, a white elephant in the room and we are not talking about that white elephant at all. And that white elephant is the rapid population growth in our country. Tanzania's population is doubling every 20 years. By the year 2025, we will be about 170 million Tanzanians in this country. So I feel like uh, much as we already 
you know, having these discussions if we don't project what may happen in the next 20 years, 25 years, you know, our, our ambitions of achieving primary health care for everyone in Tanzania will be uh, not achievable if we don't take into consideration population growth. But this is also very important because uh, when you look at the demographic structure of our country, majority of Tanzanians are young people and they don't pay taxes. You know, majority of Tanzanians are below the age of 15. They don't contribute anything into taxes. And when you look at the Tanzania tax base now, my colleague from the Minister of Finance, you will find that, you know, very few actually, with a population of about 70 million now, it's just a small fraction of Tanzanians who are paying taxes. So, therefore, collecting domestic revenues for financing primary health care is a bit of a, a challenge. So, I would like uh, the Deputy uh, Permanent Secretary and Dr. Ntuli just to give us a comment on how are you factoring population growth in, in all the projections and the plans you are making for achieving universal health coverage in Tanzania. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we'll take two more questions and then we'll get a reflection. Uh, my Dr. Name Simba, is, if you can move here. My name is Dr. Julius Nyasongo and the head of division from Buru Town Council. My question is, from the panelists we had, uh, our neighbor's country has made a step on collection of revenue and uh, levies from other sources and the direct allocating to the, to the health issues. So I had uh, one of the representatives from the Minister of Finance uh, commenting on how the government uh, prepared it to strengthen the primary health care to the lower level. But when our country will now start prioritizing and allocating levy direct from other sources of revenues, direct funding to the health sectors, like what it has been done to Zimbabwe and other countries, toward achieving at least 15% allocation to our budget. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Sim. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Uh, let me join also my colleagues to thank uh, the keynote speaker and the, moder and the uh, panelists for quite eloquent presentations that actually has revealed a number of issues, strengths and opportunities that we have in this country that if we would have used them, I think we wouldn't have been here now. Uh, for the sake of, I'm told there are people who uh, can't speak English, and for the sake of them, because I want everybody to get the point very clearly, I will give my comment in Kiswahili, and if need be, I will translate in English, rather than doing the reverse. Comment yangu ni hivi. Imezungumzo vizuri kwamba vertical approach katika implementation ya primary health care na hapa nazungumzia primary health care district level kwenda chini ndio emphasis hizi unapozungumzia zina operate vertically theory zote zinakataa Sasa tunajiuliza kwa nini tumekuwa tukitekeleza kwa kutumia mfumo huo wa vertical kwa miaka yote pamoja na kwamba tumekuwa tukiimba wimbo wa integration sasa zaidi ya miaka 40 Tunaambiwa kuna hatua zimefanyika tupo kama vile tunaanza integration wakati sasa hivi ndio tulikuwa tunatakiwa tuwe tumemaliza integration swali ni kwa nini tumechelewa kwa nini tunasuasua hili swali kama hatujajiuliza na hatujui jibu lake tutaendelea kudelay katika integration na labda hizo sababu zitakapo badilika tutajikuta tunarudi tena kwenye verticalization my 
point yangu hapa nayotaka kui drive ni kwamba kuna vitu ambavyo vinatusukuma katika kufanya mambo yetu kwa kutumia mfumo msonge verticalization na msukumo huo ni pesa za kutoka nje tunapozipata tunabweteka tunapobweteka hii misingi tunaiona na tunaijua lakini hatuitekelezi pale tunapopata matishio kwamba wafadhili wanajitoa ndipo hapo tunainuka kuanza kukumbuka na kufikiria jinsi ya kuintegrate sasa sidhani kama huu ni utaratibu mzuri kuna mzungumzaji mmoja amezungumza vizuri sana jinsi ambavyo tunaweza tukapata pesa ya kuendesha huduma zetu za msingi nimezipenda zote ukiziangalia nitazitaja nita, chache tu matumizi ya pesa kuhakikisha kwamba pesa inayopatikana inatumika kwa sababu zilizo kusudiwa hivi hili tunahitaji dona kupanga na kutumia kwa kutumia akili kwamba peleka hela yako pale ambapo utapata matunda makubwa haihitaji pesa ya kigeni sitaki kurudia lecture uh, mazungumzo yake lakini ukiangalia haya yote yanatekelezeka bila ya mfadhili sasa swali tumejiuliza hivi kwa nini hatukuwa tunayatekeleza kama tulikuwa hatuyatekelezi na sababu hatuzijui tuzijue sababu kama tunazijua tujiulize kwa nini hatutekelezi pamoja na kwamba sababu tunazijua thank you asante professor simba naambia hapa wata kamisha umeme kidogo kwa wenzetu watakao jibu watajitahidi kuongea kwa sauti kubwa ili atakavyokuwa anabadilisha pia kusiwe na changamoto naomba nikukaribishe Dr. Maera kuni swali na Dr. Nsuli swali la kwamba kwa nini tunatumiaje maoteo ya ukuaji wa watu population katika kuandaa mipango yetu na vile vile wizara ya fedha atatujibia swali la namna ambayo wizara ya fedha inaweka kipaumbele kwenye kuweka fedha zaidi kwenye sekta ya afya na hasa kwenye ile ngazi ya msingi Asante wakati tunatafakari naomba kidogo tusubiri kwanza Samani sana naibu katibu mkuu wakati tunatafakari yaliozungumzwa sasa hivi naomba kwa dakika kwa dakika moja hivi tunafanya mabadiliko ya umeme kwa hiyo tutulie baada ya dakika moja basi naibu katibu mkuu utakuja kuendelea na ule utaratibu Asanteni sana na tuwe tayari kwa hilo karibu Management ya ukumbi endelee sasa Dr. Bayara Karim. Uh, 
Asante asante moderator kwa swali zuri. Mimi niseme swala la population growth na kwamba tunatumiaje hizo takwimu kwa ajili ya kupanga mipango yetu. Niseme Wizara ya Afya pamoja na Wizara ya Ofisi Ofisi ya Rais Tamisemi tunashirikiana ka, kwa karibu sana na NBS National Bureau of Statistics wale wa takwimu ambao ndio huwa wanapita kutafuta sensa na kujua takwimu zilizopo alafu huwa tunazitumia hizo takwimu katika kufanya maoteo ya jinsi ya kupata ku, ku, kupata dawa lakini jinsi ya kuwa na kwa sababu lego ni kupeleka huduma ya afya kwa wananchi ndio unakuta kuna sera nyingine zinatokea kwamba tuhakikishe kwamba kila kijiji kwa mfano tunakuwa na zahanati lakini kila kila kwata tunakuwa na kituo cha afya na kila alimashari tunakuwa na hospitali ili tuweze kuwafikia wananchi kwa karibu kulingana na takwimu zile ambazo zinakuwa zipo lakini takwimu hizo hizo pia ndio zinatusaidia kujua wapi tuongeze kituo cha afya na kadhalika lakini pia tunafanya tuna takwimu kwamba tutanunua dawa kiasi gani na kadhalika swali hili kwa vile ni swali la kisela zaidi ni kwamba yote yanayofanyika si kwamba yanafanyika bila kutumia takwimu na tunafanya kwa karibu sana kwa mfano sensa ya mwaka 2022 imeshatupatia takwimu zote ambazo tunazitumia katika kufanya mipango yetu lakini pia na sisi tunapokuwa tunatoa afua mbalimbali za, za, za afya huwa tunaelekeza upatikanaji wa takwimu na kwamba mipango mingi ifanyike kutokana na takwimu kwa hiyo ninakubali kwamba ni kweli population yetu inakuwa kwa kasi kubwa na ni exponential growth lakini mipango inayofanyika inaendana pia na matumizi ya hizo takwimu. Nimkaribishe Dr. Nturi ili aweze kusemea lakini pia tunaye Dr. Grace hapa anaweza akasema zaidi pia. Kama hata kuna kitu kuongezea. Asante. Sababu ya mimi nitamkaribisha Wizara ya Fedha. Za msingi inakwenda kuzifinance yenyewe. Sasa ili uwe na hiyo fedha ili uwe na hiyo sustainability lazima uainishe ni vyanzo gani vya fedha Mkireje, mkirejea kwenye ule muswada wa bima afya kwa wote ambao sasa hivi imeshakuwa sheria kwa sababu imesha sainiwa na mheshimiwa rais imeainisha hizi fedha ambazo zitakwenda kuhudumia wananchi wote zitatoka wapi kwa hiyo ni hatua kwa hatua na ndio hatua ambayo tumefika kuelekea huko ambako sasa serikali inachukua jukumu lake moja kwa moja kwa kisha kwamba inahudumia huduma zake zote yenyewe bila bila kutegemea sana misaada kutoka nje kwa sababu niseme tu kweli sio Tanzania pekee tu ni dunia nzima kwenye hizi huduma za afya huwezi kusema kwamba kila kitu nitafanya mwenyewe lakini kama serikali tunao wajibu wa kufanya sisi eneo letu kubwa na ndio maana tumekwenda kwenye mswada wa bima afya kwa wote ambao unapunguza utegemezi sehemu kubwa itachukuliwa itakuwa inafanywa na serikali kwa hiyo nitaka kuli, kuliweka hilo kwa kufanya ushirikiano wa wadau wa maendeleo na hasa kwenye maeneo ambayo wao watakuja ku Asante sana Dr. Grace. Najua kuna labu. Basi tumefikia mwisho wa majadiliano yetu. Niwashukuru watu wa mada wote. Naomba tuwapigie makofi matatu. Tunashukuru sana kwa mjadala mzuri. Mimi nitatoa tu kwa kifupi point tatu katika yote ambayo yamejifanya mambo mengi kwa kupeleka fedha moja kwa moja kwenye vituo na haya yote yalikuwa yanalenga kwenye kuboresha huduma ya afya kwenye ngazi ya msingi lakini pamoja na yote hayo bado kuna mengi ambayo tunaweza kuyafanya na la kwanza ujumbe ambao umekuja kwenye majadiliano yetu siku ya leo bado tunahitaji fedha zaidi ziweze kwenda kule kwenye ngazi ya msingi we need more money to the primary health care na ngazi ya msingi ni kwenye yule mwananchi. Kwa maamuzi yote ambayo yanafanyika kwenye Wizara ya Fedha, Wizara ya Afya, Tamisemi ni muhimu yakawa yanamtazama yule mwananchi alioko kwenye ngazi ya kijiji, kwenye ngazi ya ni matumizi sahihi ya fedha kidogo tulizonazo kuweza kutupatia matokeo makubwa kwenye utoaji wa huduma za afya kwenye ngazi ya msingi. Tumeona ndio kuna utaratibu wa DFF sasa hivi fedha zinaenda moja kwa moja kwenye ngazi ya dispensary, kituo cha afya na hospitali za wilaya lakini bado tunategemea utaratibu huo ndani ya wizara ya fedha fedha zimfuate mwananchi pale alipo na ziweze kutoa huduma karibu na yule mwananchi alipo maamuzi 
kwenye kitu gani kitolewe lakini tukiwa na utaratibu mzuri wa kufanya kazi kwa pamoja kuandaa mipango na bajeti kwa pamoja na wote tukiweza kujua mahitaji sahihi kwenye ngazi ya msingi kwa mwananchi itatusaidia sana kuongeza ufanisi katika utoaji wa huduma za afya lakini katika yote huduma ya afya ya msingi tunaambiwa asilimia sabini mpaka themanini wanategemea huduma ya, ya, ya afya ya msingi ile dispensary na kituo cha afya kilicho la kwanza ni waombe watu wote ambao wako nje ya ukumbi huu sasa ingie ni ndani mchukue nafasi zenu lakini la pili leo ni siku kubwa tunapo ingia kwenye siku hii ya ufunguzi wa mkutano huu mbele ya mgeni wetu rasmi lazima tuonyeshe furaha msingi ni chombo cha kufikisha huduma za afya kwa wote nchini ni ufurahi mioyo yote itononoke hiki ni kikosi maalum kabisa Ya tunawasubiri kwa hamu. Na naomba mawasiliano kati ya fundi mitambo kule na kwaya naomba yawe makubwa. Maana akija mgeni rasmi hatutachukua muda. kamati ya kila mtu akae kwenye eneo ambalo limekusudia wa uma Mwendo na eka endeleza, kwa 
Kazina iendelele, 